welcome to the Pirate pi- uh, the Pirate the Pirate by Iron Health podcast. The Powered by Iron time. Health podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna roll with that. Um, I am Matt, marketing manager for Iron Health, with Anthony. Give us your title, what you do here. I'm a physical therapist in Briarcliff Manor. Okay, wow, he's getting official. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to speak proper at all. Yeah, I got you. Please don't, please don't. <laughs> Initially, our idea was going to be like I was just going to sit at a desk and interview, and you were mm-hmm. going to be laid out here, and yeah. I was going to like paint you yep. on a canvas, and but for then, budgetary reasons, that fell through. We moved off that? Yeah, okay. yeah, hard pivot. We were just like, let's keep it traditional, you gotcha. know? I don't think the optics would be good. Good so, call, we'll see. Yeah, hey, who knows? <laughs> anyway, you were on the podcast because you were Iron Igniter for uh, August. Mm-hmm. Iron Igniter is kind of our version of Employee of the Month, and you got it for uh, our core value of educator. Mm-hmm. Why'd you get that? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> uh, I think, first off, as PTs, education's a huge um, component of what we do and what we try to do. Um, so for me, I think like two key categories of it that are important are, number one, making sure that you yourself are educated and staying up to date with the best information possible, um, the best evidence to inform your decision making. and so. I think that I tried my best to do that and try to help everybody out with that as best I can. And then number two is educating our patients and our clients the best that we can do. And if number one is not there, then it's very hard to do number two. So try to do that as best as possible. Cool. And I mean, I'm part of that group that votes on the Iron Igniter. So like the main reason you got it was actually not so much educating you know, your clients, your patients, yeah. but it was the journal club aspect that you lead. Mm-hmm. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so here we started, I think last year, a journal club where every month I'm trying to find some sort of research. Hopefully it's from that month, but sometimes it's from outside of that time frame where it's supplementing the PT's knowledge in some way. And so on my end, it's a lot of just reading different articles and trying to disseminate that as best as possible. And I like to do like a topic for each month. Cool. Yeah. What was uh, what's been your favorite article so far? So far, like, what's the biggest piece of knowledge that you've been able to pull? I think for me, um, being in Briarcliff, we see a lot of uh, people undergoing ACL reconstruction. So for me, like going down that rabbit hole, I'm, I'm big on <laughs> the ACL research, and there's a lot of it coming out pretty consistently. Mm. Um, so being able to kind of see some of that firsthand, and being able to interact with the research and gathering data from there and trying to implement it into practice has been very helpful for me. And so, especially here, helping out um, Angelo and Ryan and just having more discussions based on that has been very good. That's probably my favorite area right now. Yeah, and I think Ryan's actually had like a full ACL injury, right? Ryan? Am I wrong? I don't think so. You don't think so? But that guy's working on it. Okay, let's cut that out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh-oh. No, he did a, no, he did a podcast with Joe um, a while back, and they were talking about it. Maybe it was Joe that had the injury. Joe, I believe, tore his ACL. Yeah, it was um, Joe. Yeah. Never mind. That's yeah. where the mistake came in. We can leave it in now. We, we, yeah, we came around. We, Aaron had a minor heart attack when I said that behind the camera. <laughs> fully. Like, yeah, just, behind oh, the camera. God. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we got back around to it. But, yeah, no, I mean, that is a big thing here. And, you know, you, you, it's weird because our target demographic is that older crowd, you know. Mm-hmm. But we're... Especially in Briarcliff, you see a lot of student athletes coming in for that same issue, the same ACL thing. Is there a common cause that you see or like something that's kind of consistent across those cases? I would say it's it's definitely complex and, and multifactorial. Like you have uh, contact injuries and then more non-contact injuries too. Um, we're still learning a little bit more about like how that stuff happens and like other things that are at play to influence um previously in the research like they thought it was uh, related to like hip angle especially in in younger women and ligamentous laxity and things like that which definitely play a role but i think we're learning more about some other things like um from like a biopsychosocial um, perspective like what are some societal things that play a role too a lot of our younger athletes that are 
girls and women don't have the same exposure as their male counterparts to training and different mm. types of training. Um, so that's one thing I think that is um, at play over here. I think another thing too is just um, being in a position where maybe you're playing in a game and you're distracted in some manner. Like there's an external stimulus that happens and for whatever reason, from a neurocognitive perspective, you're just like clouding your mind with different <laughs> stuff that's happening. Yeah. And so a lot of the stuff is related to like defenders when they're tracking a ball and making sudden movements. So that's a big thing that has been coming out in the research m more recently as well. So kind of in a way when they're focused on other people's movements rather than their own. Exactly. And like where they're tracking yeah. other people, yep. maybe less cognizant of their own. Yeah. They lose track of. Yeah. The, you know certain angles and they're able to mm -hmm. not able to they just they get injured yeah, yeah. exactly especially okay. in, in non-contact situations mm -hmm. obviously like if it's contact you just get hit in a bad spot there's not much you can do uh, especially if you know your foot gets stuck in the ground but from a non-contact perspective knowing some of that information is helpful from a rehab perspective in terms of like what different interventions we throw at the people and considering that throughout the process too cool what's um what's your background in terms of like how did you decide you wanted to be a PT. Yeah. Yeah. That's Everyone's big, story is, that's, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's hear it. Um, like a lot of different PTs, I had um, my first interaction with physical therapy being injured myself. Hmm. Uh, so I was a high school athlete at the time in my senior year of, of high school playing football. Hmm. And uh, week one, <laughs> fourth quarter, like game's about to end, we're just running out the clock. <laughs> I'm carrying the ball and somebody kind of wraps me up up top and I try to keep going and then somebody oh. like second defender comes in from the side tangles me up weird went down immediately knew something was bad uh, so ended up being a torn meniscus and I had an ankle sprain too at the same time um, so for me and based on my goals it made sense to pursue rehab more than surgery mm. um, so I was able to do rehab outpatient hospital setting and kind of learn more about the field and it seemed like something that would interest me for sure and something that would kind of combine my skills and, and things that I liked um, in a way where I could help other people too. So going through that rehab process I definitely learned a lot about myself and just the field and after like five weeks or so I was able to get back. So Nice. So you were able to finish out your senior season actually on the field yeah. rather than on the sideline. Which was awesome. Which is, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. That's cool. What other sports did you play? So I played football yeah. and rugby, and I ran track a little bit too. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we're gonna go into rugby now. Let's do it, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Um, I had this weird misconception that you played for one of my rival teams for a lot longer than you did yeah. up until yesterday. Yeah. Like I thought you were you were on that team the for enemy. years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long did you play rugby for? Where did you primarily play? So I started playing rugby in high school, like I said, mm. um, my sophomore year of high school. So it's kind of like. A weird story. I went to Fordham Prep in the okay. Bronx. So they had a very prominent rugby program in the 70s, 80s, and then they were on such a bad streak in the late 80s that they just completely got rid of the program. And they were like, let's focus on some other sports because this isn't working. <laughs> and uh, in 2012 or 2013, a group of seniors just decided to like, they really wanted to bring it back. And so I was kind of in that first like group of us bringing it back to the school and that was my sophomore year like I said I just got cut from the baseball team so I was kind of like down in the dumps a little bit not sure what I was going to do for the spring and You're so hit some people exactly <laughs> and so a bunch of my friends were playing or wanting to start the rugby program and and trying to do that just to kind of like feel it out if it was something that was cool and um I decided to join it was like a month into the season and just like immediately was like obsessed with it just like yeah. it's such a weird sport and it's so weird it's like way different than anything else i know like people compare it to football and soccer but it's just it's very unique yeah in it's, terms of like what you're doing consistently through the game i think it's only compared to football and soccer because football has the tackling aspect yeah it just of looks it, right? like both it looks like that <laughs> yeah. and then it looks like it's played on a soccer field and yeah. then you just you're like as a rugby player, anytime I'm like, yeah, no, it's like soccer and football combined. But in right. my head, I'm like, it's nothing like soccer and football combined. No, not combined. at all. <laughs> it's so confusing, too, if you're brand new to it. I mean, when I started, <laughs> like I said, like I had never been exposed to it. I think I was like four or five practices in before our first game. 
and being kind of like late to the season too, they threw me on with like the B squad on our uh, on like a Saturday at Randall's Island. Oh god! And, and that was my first game, and they were just like, "Hey, you're playing fly half today. Like you're starting at fly half." And I'm like, "Cool. Like what's a fly? What half? is a, literally on my phone? Like before the game, like what is a fly half? What does a fly half do in a game?" Um, so that was really funny to just yeah. like go out there and, and make mistakes and kind of learn like that which is different than all the other sports I was playing at the time. I'm trying to expo- like figure out how I would explain to somebody what a fly half does, and I'm like, like I don't know, they wear number 10. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all I have that's concrete. Like, you know that's funny to, like, that be your first exposure to playing, like, yeah. in a game. Oh, entirely. It's kind of like, like almost like a quarterback in football. Yeah. Like, you're kind of running things from, like, the, the back line. Yeah. And just doing that with no training or, like, understanding Nothing of the game at all, at all is hilarious Nothing to me. I, I mean, yeah. you can't block for the person in rugby, so, like, yeah. Once you have the ball, it's kind of you either got to pass it's it. It's behind you, yeah. or you're a dead man. <laughs> yeah, it's free for all too. It's free for all. Um, yeah. That's interesting because uh, I started playing rugby in college. Mm-hmm. Same kind of thing where the team was dissolved, not because it wasn't doing well, but because some people got a little too intoxicated on campus and decided to roll a car onto the quad, flip it over, and turn it and light it on fire. Yeah. Um, that was in the '80s. I was not there. And then, <laughs> and then while I was there. Um, a few guys decided to start it back up, and I was one of those first core guys. But, mm-hmm. like, I didn't know any of the rugby positions, any, like, tackle form, yeah, nothing. You know? Yeah. I got recruited because I was lifting in the gym, and they were like, you want to play rugby? And exactly. I was like, Do yeah. you guys run too much? No. And like, but you get tackled. Okay. And you but, get to score, too, as a bigger guy. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, it's yeah. great. You know, normally we don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I go to the first practice, and we just got a new coach, and I was wearing, like, old wrestling shorts I didn't wrestle yeah they, they were just like my cousin's hand-me-downs or something and I yeah. was like go to the coach I'm like what position should I focus on he goes he used to wrestle you should uh, be a flank and before I even had a chance to correct him yeah there you are <laughs> he was gone and I've been flanking for 11 years now nice yeah <laughs> only flanker or you uh, been doing I, other stuff too so I've played every position on the field at least once um, flank has always been the main and then loose head prop, but I, I really try not to prop anymore. Nice, man. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. What was your main spot? Was it fly or did you? So I kind of played the whole back line. Okay. I think uh, my junior, I I played like pretty much every game at outside center, which is also very yeah. funny being like a smaller dude playing that position. You got to be able to hit some people at outside center. Yeah, just yeah. just sticking me in there, like get your head in there and get involved. Um, and then my whole senior year, I played pretty like wing for the most part okay. and then like a little bit of fullback but yeah back line yeah nice yeah rugby's one of those sports where it takes at least four or five games before you're like yeah you any idea of cohesion on that on that field i was like two seasons in still like learning like what you're supposed to do just like what's happening just yeah. like especially with like offsides too very loosely defined like we don't know what it is but like you have the <laughs> feeling of what it is <laughs> But, like, yeah. just from watching enough I, I still get like calls on me like a penalty and I'm like, like what was where was I like, offsides yeah yeah oh. okay yes if you say so yeah <laughs> um did you get any your your injury that led you towards physical therapy was from football right yeah. you said yeah. um and that was during your senior year fall season mm-hmm. so were you able to come back and play rugby at the same level that you were beforehand after that yeah, I mean, I yeah. felt pretty good for the most part. Okay. I think part of, um, like, what makes PT interesting or, like, special for me is mm-hmm. being in the shoes of a young athlete and knowing, like, at some point in the rehab, like, you feel, like, just confused as to, like, what's going on? Am I going to be able to get back to the same level? And it's frustrating, and, like, you don't know kind of, like, where you are. And so, for me, that's something that, like, I definitely want to get across to people when I see them, especially in Brockwood, since we see that population so much. Like, how do we get you in the best possible situation so that you're not only getting back to the sport, but to the same level of performance that you were previously? Yeah. And so there's a lot that happens there and a lot of getting to know the person and and building a rapport and being honest with them um, to truly get from point A to point B there. And so I was able to play spring season rugby. Um, Things did feel a little bit different for me, I think. And then I ended up having another injury, which is unrelated. It was for my shoulder. Hmm. Um, But there were definitely times where I felt like my knee influenced some of the other stuff going on, too. Okay. I mean, 
going back to the physical therapy side of things, mm-hmm. like it's got to be comforting for your patients, especially the younger ones that come in with those sports related injuries. And you can be like, no, I've been through this. Like, we're going to get you back to where you were, if not better, because you're going to have a better understanding of the biomechanics and all that. For sure. I think like the hardest part for me, too, is communicating when someone has to not be playing because mm-hmm. I know how much it sucks to be out. And like, it's really tough to have that conversation with most people. And you, you just have to do your best to put them in the best possible is that situation. You, is that when you whip out the uh, return to sport plan? Be like, yeah. <laughs> be like, this is where we need you to be, but you're all the way over here. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely part of it. And then like measuring stuff throughout too, so it's not mm-hmm. a surprise when we're getting close to whatever we think the end is. Yeah. Like that's gotta be something that we're measuring throughout too, so we have a good idea of where we're at. Like we should never be surprised by the data that we're collecting if we're doing a good job. What do you use as like determining markers for that return to sport? Like. And I'm sure it depends on the sport and, you know, the different aspects of it, but like what are certain constants that you look for when trying to get someone back on the field? Yeah, I mean, people present uh, present like in all different scenarios of this, um, but for sure we want to have like good isolated objective tests and measures, meaning like if we have a knee injury, uh, some kind of knee injury, we're looking at range of motion and strength, obviously, as our like this is what we need to have squared away right away. Yep. Swelling, things like that. So we're measuring that throughout. And then kind of as we're working towards different movements and integrating some of that stuff, we're looking at capacity testing. So uh, what's your like force production quality like or strength? <laughs> if I'm being very fancy for no reason. But like <laughs> your ability to produce force meaning strength. Uh, so we have like- You want to give us the equation for that too, no. Einstein? <laughs> Jeez. So we have a, a Tindec dynamometer that we use where we're yep. measuring that and then we're collecting that throughout the process too. That's one of our hallmarks for like return to running or um, plyometric activities, like making sure that's cleared away first. Um, other than that, like more just like movement competency type of stuff. Are you able to move similarly on the injured side versus the uninjured side, kind of seeing what that looks like and measuring that throughout too. And then obviously like once you're closer to the return to sport, doing more like hop testing and um, some of the other stuff that's in like that return to sport battery, like vertical jump testing, things like that. Cool. Is there, I feel like for me with injury, there would be something where it's, uh, as we get closer, those initial tests, those initial like hop tests, the ones where it's more athletically inclined, Yeah. those would scare the hell out of me. Yeah. How do you manage that fear? Because it's, all right, so... Injuries like this, it's not like you have a cut that needs stitches and it's like, okay, the cut's closed up. Yeah, I got a scar there, but I'm good to go. Mm-hmm. It's internal. Like, you're not getting constant imaging on it. For so sure. what's, what are the steps or what are some tools that you use to kind of comfort someone going back into that? Yeah, I mean, that's huge. Like, part of my philosophy, too, and everybody here, which I think we do a great job of, is setting people up for wins. Like, you never want to be exposing someone for the first time to like a stimulus and saying all right let's test this before we've ever done that or something similar beforehand so building up to it building up to it for sure but like in a way too you want to be showing the person that they're making progress and that they're trending towards whatever test that we're doing or whatever type of movement that we're evaluating like it's never like all right we're showing you this for the (laughs) first time let's do it and let's try to measure it and then base your return to sport off of this. Like that's crazy. And people are going to obviously get anxious about that. Yeah. We've been uh, only doing manual stretching for the last five weeks, but how about you uh, jump on these plyo boxes? Right, like, that, like that's crazy. Like it yeah. makes no sense. <laughs> so you have to be putting your person in the best possible situation to um, take on those challenges throughout. And not everything is very structured in terms of like, all right, we're doing, step one, two, three, but you always want to be evaluating something as you're going along the way to say like, now you're capable of doing this. Let's try it out in this way. And then very infrequently have I been in a situation where someone's like, you know, trying something for the first time and and they don't succeed and they're Mm -hmm. like having some sort of, you know, negative reaction to it. Yeah. That the goal is to never have that happen. No one should ever be leaving feeling worse about themselves. Yeah. So setting them up for the win, like putting the test in front of them that you know that they're going to accomplish, that they're yeah. ready for. Yeah. So. And that takes a lot of uh, foresight on mm-hmm. our part and making sure that you're kind of dialed in from the jump in terms of this is the progression that I'm expecting and these are the things that I'm testing out and kind of working towards throughout. You can't just only have the end goal in mind. You kind of have to have tests and, and like you said, checkpoints throughout. 
Yeah. All right, cool. I think we're going to wrap it up. But before we do, any closing thoughts from you or, you know, anything you want to say? Thank you for having me, Matt. There you go. Glad to have you on. This was... This is interesting. No one ever thought that Anthony would be on the podcast. You cornered got him me. Here. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you, you corner me in the Aki room. That's true. Yeah. We just kind of walked in here I'm, with microphones I'm and very set up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this has been the Powered by Iron Health podcast. Got it right that time. I'm Matt. This is Anthony. We'll see you guys here. <laughs>